Uh, let me know if there are any technical glitches. I'll just be a silent participant. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. This is the Fridays for Future webinar on uh, EIA, that is the Environment Impact Assessment. We have with us uh, Neha Sena. Uh, hi, Neha. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for uh, being here and uh, taking the time out to explain what does the environment uh, impact assessment, the latest draft is going to do. Uh, so uh, for all our uh, viewers, Neha Sena is a conservation biologist and author. She works with the Bombay Natural History Society. Uh, and she's a very popular columnist and has a forthcoming book, uh, Wild and Willful on Indian Wildlife, uh, which is due this year. So that's must, that must be pretty exciting, Neha. And she tweets um, from the handle at uh, Neha, that is N-E-H, a A underscore Sinha. Um, Neha, over to you uh, on this, uh, you know, most recent debacle that our government has uh, pushed out. So uh, a quick introduction um, of yourself as well as, uh, uh, you know, taking forward the EIA conversation. Okay. I won't introduce myself. Thank you for introducing me, but let me get straight into what an environment impact assessment is. So if you look at this picture, there's a river and there's probably... Uh, this is a tropical rainforest uh, on the banks of the river. And suppose I want to make uh, waterways, uh, that is highways on uh, this river, for example, which India has done on the river Ganga. Uh, suppose I just want to plonk a few ships carrying coal and oil down this beautiful blue river. What am I going to do? So I'm uh, saying that I'm going to have ships on this river and they're going to go down and they're going to carry uh, coal and oil in a very green manner because um, it's less emissions. But in order to do that, I'm going to make ports. I'm going to dig uh, deeper into the river, dredge the river. I'm going to make places where the ship can stop if it's um, damaged in any way. And I'm going to cut some of these trees because I need space to do all of this. Therefore, I need to have a good understanding of what my project is going to look like. And any project that involves um, a certain size should therefore have an impact assessment. So even something that sounds green, like taking a ship down a river, uh, you know, which is seen as a sort of like a green thing to do, should have an impact assessment. We should have a fair sense of what the project is going to do in order to uh, understand uh, what, what we are getting into. Environmental impact assessments, the most important thing to know, they are done before a project starts. So uh, going back to my previous example of this river, which uh, is going to take ships of coal, which has already happened in the river Ganga, uh, the trees are going to go, the river is going to be deepened and dredged, and the ships themselves may sink. Uh, it has already happened. There have been four cases this year in which barges carrying fly ash, toxic fly ash from coal, coal-fired plants have sunk in the River Ganga, and uh, that's highly toxic. So we need to have an entire infrastructure of things in order to support the uh, activity that we want to do. Therefore, we need an impact assessment, and therefore an environment impact assessment always happens before a project starts. And that is the entire logic of an EIA, that I understand what I'm getting into. I understand how much I have to build, how much I, how many trees I need to cut down or how, how much water I need to get, whatever the case may be. And then I decide whether the project should get an environmental clearance. So this has been our law this far. So it's important to understand that an environmental clearance is subject to getting an environmental impact assessment made. So first the EIA is made based on what the EIA says, the environmental clearance is granted and that is the way it is right now legally. So what are the things that an environment impact assessment may consider? It may consider uh, what are the species in the area? So if you're talking about a river, for example, River Ganga has the Gangetic dolphin, which is a blind dolphin adapted beautifully to the river Ganga. And um, so an EIA should consider what are the species over there and what are the habitat needs. So in this picture, you see this uh, thing hanging. I think some of us may identify what this is. This is a, uh, this is a bio nest, a weaver bird nest. And they make these incredible uh, nests that hang upside down. The, the opening of the nest is at the bottom. And you see that mango yellow colored bird sitting on that 
a little plume of grass is actually a bio weaver. So this bio weaver makes this nest. It has a particular habitat need. For example, it requires grasses to make that nest. And usually it will nest on a tree which is near a water body. And these nests are going to hang off the water body because that's how it protects its nest from predators. So for example, if I have, uh, if I'm going to make a big project that's going to cut trees in a particular area or fill up the wetland, I need to consider which are the species if I have the bio weaver, then what are the kind of habitat needs of the bio weaver? All of that needs to go into the EIA. So what are we doing? We're trying to understand the site. We are trying to understand the species of the site. And we're trying to understand whether we can go ahead with the project based on these considerations. Uh, we also consider things like disturbance to habitat. Now, this is a actually a wetland, it doesn't look like one, but this is Kolaru wetland in Andhra Pradesh. And this is a big road that has been made on top of the wetland. In order to make this road, they would have um, made this bridge, they would have uh, basically uh, filled up part of the wetland. And uh, it also, a project also brings with it many other things, which would be pollution, noise, perhaps invasive species and other ancillary industries that may come up when you make a, say a big road or you make a big port, uh, other businesses come up. So all of that needs to be considered. This is how an EIA is supposed to perform its function. It has to consider all of these things. So coming to what the change is now. So that was what the law has been so far. And even, even we have this law which says we need an EIA and after that the clearance comes, the EIAs have been pretty bad cut and paste jobs. There have been uh, very funny kind of species lists that EIAs have made. I have read EIAs, but there's a bird list, a habitat and bird list, and the birds are rat and cow and dog and mouse, things like that. And uh, what does the EIA draft 2020 say? It, it basically says, I'm only going to focus on three things because those three things are of a lot of relevance uh, to our developing nation. The first is that environmental projects can get clearances after the project has started. So for all those projects that started illegally without getting an EIA, without getting a clearance, they have a chance to get a clearance even if they have started illegally, they started, they're running, they've completed their construction and they're basically running. Let me give an example and you know, public memory is short. So we should not forget what happened in Vishakhapatnam, uh, that gas leak from the LG polymers plant. Now, LG Polymer did not actually have an environmental clearance to be running over there. And uh, they were running without a clearance uh, there wasn't a proper EIA that was done. And this is what happens when, uh, when we have projects that just come up, which do not consider fully the liability that it can cause in public health. So for example, uh, you know, how close should a polymer plant be to where people live? So should there be some minimum distance between um, uh, uh, something that has potentially dangerous uh, fumes and from where other people live? So, uh, you know, these are kind of guidelines that EIAs are supposed to tackle. So, for example, if I'm making a dam, the EIA of the dam has to consider what are the places that would get submerged or, you know, how many trees would need to be cut down or, you know, how do we... Uh, how do we go about uh, mitigating the impacts, the negative environmental impacts, if there are many? So if I say, the moment I say that you have started a project which did not have an EIA, which did not have a clearance, and it's okay for you to pay a fine and keep running, the moment I say that, the very purpose of an EIA is defeated. So if I go back to my first slide, which is the river and this beautiful, you know, rainforest. Now, suppose I cut down all the trees and I put my coal barges going down this beautiful river. And I also try to straighten the river so that the time uh, for the transport is shorter. I also dig the river bed so that, you know, a lot of water is there for my ship. And I've been doing this illegally. So you're actually giving me a chance to say that here is a fine, I'm gonna pay a fine and I'm going to get an environmental clearance, right? So it kind of defeats the purpose of having an EIA. It basically is against the very principle of an EIA. So this is what the new draft says, that you can actually get away uh, without an EIA if you've started your project. The second thing of great concern to Fridays for Future, to anybody who would be interested in the environment, is that almost the entire building and construction sector is now exempt 
from getting environmental impact assessments. So earlier you had um, buildings above uh, 20,000 square meters. So that would be maybe the size of a mall a small size mall would be 20,000 square meters. So all buildings above 20,000 square meters required an EIA. And now that has been increased to 150,000 square meters, which would be the size of a large airport. So basically everything below 150,000 square meters does not require an EIA, which is basically exempting almost the entire construction sector. Uh, large buildings, that's a very large building. And uh, let's also remember, how does this impact us? Um, the construction sector is one of the most greenhouse gas intensive sectors. Uh, it is a huge uh, contributor to climate change because construction dust uh, adds to air pollution, it can add, it can add to other problems of uh, uh, global warming because the transport, the mining of material required for construction are very big factors. There's a thriving sand mining mafia in India, which basically fuels the construction boom in India. So, you know, if the sand is coming illegally, all of that needs to be factored into the EIA. So, you know, if we are basically exempting this huge greenhouse gas intensive sector from EIA, then certainly that cannot be a good thing for environment and for the future that we all are so concerned about. And finally, uh, the third point I want to make is that if there are violations that, you know, somebody hasn't got the EIA or somebody hasn't got the clearance, the violations are supposed to be reported by the project developer himself, which is, uh, you would agree, a very ridiculous proposition. So nobody's going to say I'm breaking the law. It's very, it's very, uh, it's a kind of unreasonable expectation. Um, or it can only be done by the government. And I think for a good democracy, for, for a country that that you know is is vibrant or a country that you know believes in governance you know everybody every citizen should have the right to report violations the right to report violations cannot be just with the government or just with the project developer because we are not sure you know uh, how uh, how much uh, responsibility they wish to take so those are my three points i want to make about the draft and this is a beautiful uh, piece of art done uh, by um, students uh, from Assam who are opposing the mining, uh, proposed mining in the Hing Patkai, which is uh, this rainforest in Assam. This is going to be a coal mine. Again, this is something that has already received, um, you know, a nod from uh, extremely high uh, ranking National Board for Wildlife. And uh, just to say that a lot of our important places, places important for wildlife and biodiversity are being parceled off. And if the EIA draft becomes law, it will essentially become easier to convert land, which is natural land or wild land or you know, wildlife habitat into projects much more easily. Those are the three points I wanted to make. If there are any questions, we can take them now. Thanks a lot, Neha, for that uh, really important, uh, uh, the three points you made. Um, I'm just going to look at the questions, but uh, in the meantime, um, uh, I think one of the common things that people are asking is that what is the immediate impact it's going to have on a lot of these projects uh, that are lined up and uh, how are we going to, um, especially because now the deadline has been extended till 30th June, yeah. but then again, there will be a process after that. So a, I think a lot of people have been uh, asking on different groups, like what's the timeline like, and you know, uh, what is the best way to start actually uh, addressing this, looking at all these regional projects and biodiversity reserves, which are under threat. Okay, so there are two things. The first is that, yeah, the deadline has been extended because a lot of people asked for it. So, you know, it's, it's great that at least the deadline got extended because otherwise it seemed like it was just getting pushed through during a lockdown, during a time when people are sick or anxious to push through such an important and far reaching change, which is ridiculous, right? So I would urge everyone to continue writing and sending hard copies of their resistance to the ministry. And uh, don't send emails and, you know, 
letters if you can i mean actually it's it's i think it's better it, it gets more uh, it gets more attention in a ministry if it's a letter so first of all please send your critiques of the eia act and you are free to make your own opinion i won't tell you what to say but you know if you want resources there are many of us who are working on that the second thing is usually how long does it take to become uh, a law it depends on the intent really of the government so you know this one could become a law this year itself and there are many laws that have just come very very fast the national waterways act which i spoke about in which basically 100 rivers of india are going to be made into highways meaning ships are going to be uh, sailing on those um, rivers uh, for commercial use and this is really bad news for many of these rivers because uh, there's a lot of biodiversity there and uh, these are going to be ships carrying coal and stuff which is not you know it's very the ganga and the yamuna are the world's most polluted rivers so they don't need more of this uh, kind of load or pollution so i can't say when it will become a law but certainly i would say keeping up the resistance is really important if you feel that this is not something india needs then we certainly should write about it and we should send our comments and our uh, ideas to the ministry and it's it's great that it has been extended so far and it's also a shame that they would try to kind of do this during the lockdown because this is not the time when yeah. uh, this is not how democracy should be working this is not good governance. absolutely yeah no that makes sense and i think um now that there is more knowledge about generally the most critical points on eia people are also feeling confident enough to make specific critiques yes um, i just wanted to come to that it's also yeah. important for people who are familiar with the region to be able to critique an eia and a lot of eias Correct. you know are wrong or they you know name funny species like i said there was an eia done for delhi in which there was a bird list with you know rat and cat and donkey and cow in it and there are many eias that are copied from other countries and they have like african species in them or or they just don't name the species so you know like yeah. for example an eia not naming a tiger or a elephant you know it's very very common so it's 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 you know citizens should be involved also in reading an eia and also in you know uh, just having the ownership to just to come in and to say i am familiar with this area and yes you get this species over here or the 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 flowers list is not complete now the hing pad thai for example uh, has uh, orchids it has uh, orchids it is a rainforest it has elephants it it has uh, uh, gibbons it has it has incredible biodiversity and you know typically that will not appear in any eia so then you know for people should uh, be able to come in and say don't do this yeah that makes sense um and also there is this um this this really strong feeling that how the these uh, uh, drafts are written that yeah. they really look at human beings and communities and biodiversity as very different elements because uh, right. somebody also asked like you know how how does it uh, uh, how will it impact local communities so that that element is almost missing in the draft or um in general like that's the kind of language they use with where, where it's just like oh x y z but like hey what about like human yeah. life yeah absolutely and one of the other aspects is that uh, people are expected to give comments uh, you know within public hearing uh, that is part of the eia so every eia uh, you know you're supposed to have an eia and then you're supposed to have a public hearing uh, which is you know basically aimed at the people who live there now the public hearing uh, the time for for engaging with the public has been reduced to 20 days from 30 days so you know if you are a fisherman you are expected to give up everything read an eia which is long complex difficult full of technical terms which may also not be in your language you're expected to leave your work read the ia come for the public hearing make lucid comments and all of this has to be done in 20 days so this is certainly not something that is feasible because you are basically expecting people who are going to be dispossessed or who are going to be affected by that project to say things in a very very unreasonably short period of time so not only are we not considering uh, how communities can be involved we are also basically throwing them out of the room 
and let me you know stress again that a lot of projects have far reaching impacts and uh, the first person uh, the first uh, point of contact or the first person who gets affected deserves to have the most time to read an eia or to be part of the public hearing process in a much more participative way we already have a deeply class and caste segregated society so typically a person who's getting affected is somebody who already is marginalized so if i'm making a dam you know so who is the person who is going to be affected it's not going to be people in cities like you and me it's going to be people who live in villages along the banks of the river that's going to be dammed or if i'm making a huge port then the people getting affected are the artisanal fishermen who anyway do not have a uh, uh, you know a big voice and we've just had for example this huge cyclone coming and so who were the people who were affected exactly it wasn't so many people in kolkata it was people in 24 parganas which is an impoverished district next to the sea uh, next to sundarbans and um, a lot of those people are marginalized already so environmental impacts climate impacts always do impact the poor first and so therefore it's no stretch of imagination to say that big projects which require eias also do impact the more vulnerable communities and they deserve to have a longer window so one of the points of critique that we need to make is that the eia should give more time for public hearing and we need to right. have more time for public consultation it has been reduced to 20 days in the in the new draft and that's too short a period of time uh, to expect anyone to engage in any meaningful way no that's that's totally right we are getting a few questions one of them oh. here um, akash uh, agrawal is asking that um, can we think of uh, some other route in um, which is the least harmful to the environment in transporting goods to various parts of the globe instead of destroying the mountains or highways and his second question is is the ei draft being used as a weapon uh, for the italian project in the dibang valley for hydroelectricity okay so is there a better way to transport goods we need to make better use of what we have already i think uh, the railway lines should be used the existing railway line should be used to uh, to uh, to take goods we should be very careful whenever we come up with an idea which says this is green so for example the river um, the the waterways act is is kind of packaged as this green thing or small dams are packaged as a green solution it's not always green it totally depends on the place so you know i mean there's no one answer for all of india it depends on what we're talking about so if you're going to make a railway line through melghat tiger reserve or through the western ghats that's no good because that is absolutely precious uh, biodiversity hotspot uh, but if you're going to use existing railway lines um, uh, to move freight goods then that's that's a good thing uh, regarding italian italian is actually being considered uh, by the Uh, highest committee in the ministry of environment and forests and it would require an eia because it's a very big dam however the new uh, the section uh, for dams under the eia act the new act has uh, changed the criteria so you need to be 75 megawatts and above to be uh, to be uh, getting an eia earlier it was 50 megawatts so basically they they uh, smaller projects don't require an eia italian would require an eia because it's a, a very very big project that's going to cut 3 lakh trees thank you for that um just yeah. checking um also there was another question that why is that the developer can report on the violations and what's the story behind that I mean it's 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 very obvious why the government wanted to change this act in the first place because you know it's it's not that you know it's not as if EIAs are very critical of developers because developers pay for EIAs right having said that it is still an important process to go through so in this ease of doing business i mean there's nothing wrong with ease of doing business but it can't be at any cost right so if we have a, a global biodiversity hotspot such as um, 
in uh, Dibang or such as you have the Western Ghats where they want to make the Hubli Ankola railway line, which is also going to cut 200,000 trees for one railway line, even though alternatives exist for that. So the idea of not taking alternatives is problematic. The idea that, you know, we need to steamroll and make these projects no matter what happens is problematic. And nothing could be more ironic than the fact that we're all sitting at home right now. The entire world is in a global lockdown. I mean, even if the lockdown has kind of ended in India, the, the danger is not over. And I just want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that, you know, every single study about uh, zoonotic diseases says that diseases come from wildlife and wildlife is stressed out. So the more you stress uh, wildlife and the more you disturb their habitat, the more you are making us vulnerable to zoonotic disease. So, you know, uh, Lyme disease in, in the US has spread because of deforestation. Malaria spreads because of deforestation. And also, if you are going to stress wild animals beyond a point, they are going to shed viruses. So we, we need to actually, every scientist right now is saying, keep forests intact. There was a time when every railway line that was laid had to cut forests because everywhere there were forests. But now that's not the case anymore. Where are the forests today? In very few places. So you have oil exploration inside an elephant reserve in Assam, an elephant reserve called the Hing Patkai, that's uh, this artwork on the screen. Or you have uh, one dam that's going to you know, cut down three lakh trees um, in the Bang, or you have one single railway line that's going to cut under to, uh, another 200,000 trees in Karnataka for Hubli Ankola. It kind of doesn't make sense. So you, that's three projects. And that's already like lakhs and lakhs of trees that we can't afford to, to cut anymore. Yeah, no, totally right. Um, there is also another question on, do you see the present uh, EIA draft and the opening of all the sectors to private sector somehow linked, which was the COVID package relief. I think that's a very important point because the finance minister gave out that uh, package relief last week. And this EIA draft was, uh, you know, coincidentally a few months before this. I think, uh, well, the EIA draft uh, was written before the COVID um, thing had happened. But generally, there's a bent in the government to, uh, you know, uh, to have corporate tie ups or to give what they call the ease of doing business. So, I mean, it may not be directly linked, but the general intent is to open up the economy. And as I said, open up the economy at any cost. I mean, I think we all want the economy to do well, but you know, it cannot be left to the mercies of uh, uh, people whose only, you know, only motive is profit, right? Because we cannot expect profit to be the only value by which we live our lives. And, you know, it's like when somebody is sick, you don't just pay medicine, uh, money for medicines. It's not just a materialistic thing. You also have to take care of that person. You also have to, uh, you know, have some emotional spectrum. It's not just a materialistic transaction. Similarly, you cannot just be here on earth to just be, you know, uh, doing these material transactions in which everything is up for sale and, you know, you have some mitigation plan. It has to be something that's deeper and something that's more uh, valuable than that. And I think forests are very complex systems. And it's not easy to replace them. No matter how many plans we may make, it takes time and it takes land, which we don't actually have. So one of the biggest things to note is that, you know, whenever we are coming up with these big projects that are going to cut trees, you should ask this question. If you're going to have compensatory afforestation, where is it going to happen? So where is the land where you're going to plant double or 10 times of say three lakh trees? It, it doesn't exist. We know that it doesn't. So once it goes, it goes, right? So um, the private sector, I don't have anything against the private sector and I don't have anything against stimulus packages, but I really did not understand the stimulus package very well because there's something about interspace travel. And I also didn't understand how that was linked to COVID or how, you know, um, how basically privatizing everything does not necessarily mean that uh, the economy is going to do well. Or, that, or even that it's good for society. I think a few things need to be with the government. I think uh, it's, it's good that um, hospitals and schools are still with the government and banks are still with the government. I think that's a good thing. We need that. Uh, 
Thanks, Neha. Um, just another question there. Who are the people, uh, activists, scholars at the forefront of holding the government accountable for these new criteria? Are there prominent people or communities opposing this that aren't getting the media attention? For EIA, for the draft yes. EIA? Yes. Um, okay. So it's very legal and technical. So I'm just going to name the legal uh, people or people who are working in policy because, um, uh, you know, I think there is still a gap of understanding uh, in terms of there, there will be a lot of communities raising their voice, but there is a gap in um, understanding the issues still because it's very complicated. So I, uh, I recommend everybody to go um, on the Twitter handle of Legal Initiative for Forest and Environment, LIFE. They have a lot of analysis and commentary on EIA. They've been working on EIA for a long time and they basically work on EIA and environmental justice. So their, their concern is not just on EIAs, but also how you know EIAs can be democratized or how environmental justice can happen. So like, you know, equality is not justice. So like, for example, uh, if a project is coming up in a rich neighborhood is not the same as a project coming up in a poor neighborhood. And there are different concerns of, uh, you know, uh, um, getting the information out there, making sure people come for the public hearing, they have a full understanding of the issue, et cetera. So they work a lot on environmental justice and environmental justice is an important um, theme for us all to engage with more deeply. So I do recommend uh, looking up, uh, they have a website as well, Legal Initiative for Forest and Environment, then the Center for Policy Research, which has uh, come out with some articles and analysis of the EIA draft, uh, you know, so I also recommend looking that up. And uh, I think uh, otherwise there have been campaigns. There's a campaign run by this organization called Let Me Breathe. And uh, there's a campaign also run by Conservation India uh, on aspects of EIA. So people can look that up as well. I, I had a question by Yuvan, which I wanted to answer. So Yuvan had a question on what the youth can do for all these issues. And I know that, you know, these are issues that are very complex and they're very, uh, they're mired in jargon. And I just want to say to everybody that um, I have, uh, I'm not a student of law, but I do study law a lot. And in every country uh, of the world, law or policy or guidelines or anything legal is used to confuse people or confound people. There's a reason why it's difficult to understand why it's so full of jargon and why it is so complex. It's, it is to confound and that should not put anybody off. And it's great that you guys are having a webinar on this difficult topic because it is a difficult topic and it's actually a boring topic. And you know, a lot of people will say, why should we engage with this? Because it's so difficult to understand. And the, the thing is, it's difficult to understand because that is the language. That's the reason why there's a reason why it is so difficult. So whether it's international convention or international treaty, any kind of legalese is dense and it's okay. dense so that it's not easily understood. So let's understand that first when you talk about justice. So it is yeah. important and it's great that you're engaging, first of all. So what can the youth do? I think the youth is everything. I think, you know, it's not idealistic to say that we need to change the world. And uh, there are many ways that this can happen. And I think that um, a protest is one thing. To, to just even be an educated citizen that goes beyond the headlines is one of the greatest um, you know, resources that a country can have. And you know, maybe you're not able to change this law, but by knowing about this law, maybe you'll be able to change the next one when it comes along. So you know, it's a long fight. You know, whatever you're doing for the environment is going to be a long fight. It's gonna be your entire lifetime. And you only fail if you stop trying is what I believe. So, uh, yes, the youth should always engage and the country belongs to the youth. Of course, it also belongs to older people or of course it belongs to every citizen. But when I say it belongs to the youth, I think I'm, what I mean to say is that they're going to be here longer to yep. face the consequences of um, all these yep. decisions. And I think if young people are saying, for example, don't make, make a coal mine in an elephant reserve in Assam, then there's a reason to listen to that. Because yeah. they're also saying, don't leave us with this trash, right? You're Absolutely. going to leave us with this trashed lunar kind of moon-like planet, which has no life on it. Yeah. And you don't want to see the elephant sanctuary only in the museum. 
that's not yes, what we want. Yes, and you know, this must be the first elephant reserve to have this kind of fate. And elephant reserve is not even a legal category. You know, it's like a designation which doesn't actually have much legal protection. And that's the reason why they even made it an elephant reserve so that they could denotify it. But you know, mining is not a cautious activity. Mining, if you're going to mine for coal, then you're basically breaking up hills. You know, there, there's no exactly. two ways about it. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, there is nothing called as clean coal. <laughs> the myth that exists and that that's been trying yeah. to be promoted. Um, but yeah, that's a great point. And I think, um, um, yeah, lots of people are doing that campaign. Let India breed Fridays for Future, yeah. uh, Fridays for Future, Guwahati. Um, even other, a lot of youth groups have started talking about, a lot of celebrities have started talking about Dehang Patkai recently. Yes. Um, and uh, you're right about the fact that people really need to keep trying and because so many things are happening and the, the the details are definitely what is that term phrase right devil lies in the details the devil yeah. is in the details yeah, yeah. yeah i think it's also great that people are standing up for like i said the difficult things such as eia but also uh, something like a habitat because usually people stand up for individual animals so it'll be yes. like a yes. you know like a candlelight march for abni the tigress or ustad the tiger but you know if there is no habitat there's going to be no animals so i think yeah. you know it all begins and ends with having that plant community in that habitat so it's it's fabulous uh, that you know people want have made time to make these beautiful uh, I'm an artist myself and I'm nowhere as good as some of the art that uh, these students have done for the Hing Patka it's, it's just fabulous yeah and I think that's that's what the the entire movement needs it needs artists it needs people from everywhere talking about it because it affects everyone yes so, yeah Neha thank you so much for your time um, you that's been too. really really enlightening um I'll you know, very interesting questions came up. It's going to be recorded and uh, shared later as well. So um, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, the draft notification is not gone through in this format. <laughs> we hope. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Can thank you tell you. people uh, your Twitter handle once so that they can follow you? My Twitter handle is Neha underscore Sinha and Neha has two A's. So Neha underscore Sinha. Great. Thanks a lot, Neha. Thank um, you. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Bye.